practice here in the US. Well, all of you have likely seen a similar model of coronary artery disease. This is showing the progression of atherosclerosis over time. On the left-hand side of this figure, you see a normal, healthy coronary artery. Over time and years, as we move toward the right, we see the development of atherosclerosis within the artery. It starts off as non-obstructive coronary artery disease and then ultimately progresses to obstructive coronary artery disease. By this point, we get a narrowing of the lumen, which uh, can cause obstruction to myocardial blood flow. So this results in ischemia, and this is what we can detect on our functional testing strategies. So our functional tests are looking for ischemia and reduced blood flow. This is in contrast to an anatomic testing approach where we don't look for the presence of ischemia, but rather directly visualize the process of atherosclerosis, which allows us to look at really the whole spectrum of coronary artery disease. It's important to remember that patients with obstructive coronary disease are certainly at risk for acute coronary syndromes and events. Here we see plaque rupture. But it's, it's estimated, and some studies suggest that more patients presenting with an MI actually had previous non-obstructive disease. So the question becomes, can we do a better job of identifying these patients that are at risk for these events that we try to prevent? So when we're talking about functional versus anatomic testing, what are the tests that we're actually talking about? So from a functional standpoint, I'll talk about the three most commonly used tests here in the US. That's the exercise ECG, the stress SPECT, which is a myocardial perfusion scan, and the stress ECHO. Other functional tests are cardiac MR and PET scanning, but those are less commonly used as the initial evaluation, so I won't be talking about those today. From an anatomic standpoint, really this is when we're talking about non-invasive imaging, this is really when we're talking about the coronary CT angiogram. And it's important to distinguish this from the coronary artery calcium score, which doesn't give us information about luminal stenosis or really what the lumen of the coronary artery looks like because of a lack of IV contrast. So before we launch into a discussion of the relative effectiveness of these two different testing strategies, anatomic versus functional, I think it's important to frame our discussion around what are we going to do with this information? Because this then goes on to inform what are the types of questions that we actually need to answer from our tests. And so broadly, the two goals of treating people with stable coronary artery disease are first to improve survival and decrease cardiovascular events, and secondly, to improve quality of life, equally important. What are the interventions that we have to be able to accomplish these two goals? Well, first and foremost, the uh, intervention that has been most effective for decreasing cardiovascular events and improving survival is the use of preventative medical therapies such as aspirin, lipid-lowering medications such as statins, and ACE inhibitors. But it's important to recognize that the degree of benefit that our patients get from these preventative therapies is directly related to their level of risk. And so it's important to be able to identify a patient's level of risk because they may benefit from more intensive therapies. Revascularization is also a potential approach uh, for improving survival, but has actually never been shown to improve survival in the vast majority of patients. There is a role in patients that have severe left main disease and multivessel disease, who are certainly the minority of patients, but those are patients that we want to be able to identify on our testing because their management is going to be different. <clears throat> in terms of improving survival, really the mainstay of our therapy is anti-anginal medications, um, and it's important to identify people that are symptomatic that we can then treat with these effective medications. And then um, finally, revascularization is typically reserved for patients that have refractory symptoms um, despite uh, medical therapy. So in light of that framework of what are we going to, what are we trying to accomplish? I think the difficulty that we have in comparing the effectiveness of a functional versus anatomic approach, with anatomic being coronary CTA, is that the majority of studies that have tried to compare the effectiveness of these two strategies uh, have done so by comparing their ability to answer a simple binary question of does the patient have obstructive coronary disease, yes or no? 
And what I'm going to argue today is that is not how we should be approaching uh, this. That is not how we should be approaching this question of the um, comparative effectiveness of the two strategies, because that's looking at just a limited amount of information that we can get from these tests and that we can do better than that. Instead, I think we need to consider what are the ultimate goals of our testing, because that will um, inform the types of questions that we need to answer from our testing. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is guide appropriate medical therapy and revascularization based on um, uh, the findings of our testing. And that requires both an accurate diagnosis and taking into the perspective all of the available information we can get about diagnosis. But prognosis is also essential in this question. And the interplay of both diagnosis and prognosis are really what go on to inform the way we manage patients with stable coronary artery disease and ultimately with the goal of improving patient outcomes. So I think this is an important point that serves as the basis for uh, the rest of my talk really, is that with diagnosis alone, we have limited information and clinicians use this concept of diagnosis and prognosis on a daily basis. And so when we're comparing the effectiveness of these tests, that really needs to be um, considered. Ultimately, this boils down to a few critical questions that we need to be able to answer from our tests that can inform management. First, does my patient have coronary artery disease? Second, is my patient's coronary artery disease actually causing chest pain? And then, does my patient have severe left main disease or severe multivessel coronary disease? And finally, what is my patient's risk for bad outcomes? What's their risk of cardiac death, MI, or other cardiac events? And I'm going to say that these are the critical questions that we need to answer because this then goes on to inform our management. If the patient is having chest pain as a result of CAD, then antianginal therapies will be effective. If we identify somebody that has multivessel disease, then this is somebody that you may choose to um, undergo revascularization for the purpose of improving survival. And if a patient you identify as having very high risk for a bad outcome, those are going to be patients that we use more intensive medical therapies because they're more likely to benefit from these therapies. So let's take a look at functional testing. First, we'll start off with reviewing the diagnostic performance. So these figures that you see here are showing the sensitivity and specificity of our three most common functional testing options. So in gray, we see stress ECG, red, we see stress SPECT, and yellow is stress ECHO. These figures are based on large meta-analyses of thousands of patients that underwent both this functional test and invasive coronary angiography as the gold standard. So we're comparing what is the sensitivity and specificity of these functional tests to our gold standard of invasive angiography. Here we see that um, the stress ECG actually has a relatively modest diagnostic sensitivity of 68% in this study of greater than 24,000 patients. Functional imaging can improve our sensitivity by increasing it up into the mid to high 80% range. And then in terms of specificity, they all, function, uh, they all perform fairly similarly, but the stress spec does lag behind the other two. So it's important to consider that our diagnostic sensitivity from functional tests are generally in the 70 to mid 80% range. So we also said that um, evaluation of multivessel disease or severe left main disease is important in the initial evaluation. How well does our functional testing do in that regard? Well, this is a study that used the Duke treadmill score. I'll go into a little, little more detail about the Duke treadmill uh, score in a couple of slides. But this is a study that compared 2,800 patients that underwent a stress ECG, and they also had invasive coronary angiography. They were then stratified according to whether they were low, intermediate, or high risk based on this Duke treadmill score. And as you can see here, the Duke treadmill score as a prognostic score can identify patients that are at increased risk for this severe or extensive coronary artery disease. You see that in the setting of people that are high risk, 
they have a very high prevalence of this severe disease. Also in the setting of intermediate risk, a decently high risk of having multivessel disease. In those that have a low risk, certainly lower prevalence, but we are not able to fully rule out the presence with a prevalence of about 10% in that group. The addition of functional imaging does add some to this, but it's still not perfect. So from a prognosis standpoint, I just told you that Dr. Finn recommends the stress ECG as the initial in the initial evaluation of patients with suspected coronary artery disease. But then I also told you that the diagnostic sensitivity is actually not great. So why are we still using this test? And the answer is that it's the powerful prognosis that we get from this information. And this um, can be seen in various scoring systems, but the Duke treadmill score has been the most robustly studied and validated over the past few decades. So what is the Duke treadmill score? So it's actually a simple score based on the exercise duration during the test, degree of ST segment deviation, and the degree of angina. And through simple arithmetic, we can then go on to calculate our Duke treadmill score, which has been shown to provide a very accurate prognosis. This was shown in the original validation study of outpatients undergoing um, stress ECG in the initial evaluation of suspected angina or su suspected coronary artery disease. And we see here that the Duke treadmill score was very capable of stratifying patients according to their risk of bad outcomes. Here they looked at um, in, in greater than 600 patients followed for over four years for the risk of mortality. <clears throat> As you can see here, patients that had a low risk score had very good prognosis. They had only about a quarter of a percent mortality annually. However, those that fell into a high risk score had much worse prognosis with greater than 5% annualized mortality for those patients. Thus, based on this score, we're able to identify patients that are likely to do worse and would likely benefit from more aggressive medical therapy or revascularization. We can actually provide incremental benefit to our prognostic abilities of the stress ECG. So the, our functional imaging approaches can provide incremental benefit in prognosis over and above the stress ECG. This was shown in a um, paper that looked at 2,000 patients that underwent stress ECG as well as stress SPECT. And you can see here that patients were, accord were divided according to their Duke treadmill score based on their stress ECG, looking at the three groupings of, of the bar graphs here into low, intermediate, or high risk based on their Duke treadmill score. But then the degree of abnormality of the stress SPECT can further stratify a patient's risk of having bad outcomes, in this case, cardiac death or MI. And you can see in the hash marked um, bars that, that repre represents a normal scan. In the black bars, that's a, mi a mild ischemia. And in the solid gray bars represents severe ischemia. So we can see that in all of these Duke treadmill classifications, we can reclassify a patient's level of risk. This becomes most helpful in the intermediate risk category, where the majority of patients that were in that intermediate Duke treadmill score were actually able to be reclassified to a low risk and thus provided some reassurance. But there was um, a group of people that were found to have ischemia on their stress spec, and that uh, was associated with much worse prognosis. This, was, this has also been shown in the setting of stress echo, where we see that patients, again, are able to be stratified according to their risk of bad outcomes, in this case, MI or death over the subsequent five to seven years. The top bar here, or the top line, is showing the presence of a normal stress echo and no CAD at baseline. And you can see that it separates out from patients that have an abnormal echo, which are shown by the, the lower two lines here. But it's important to recognize that uh, the, a normal stress echo can provide very accurate prognosis, and it can provide a lot of reassurance. Here we see that those that had a negative stress echo had very good outcomes over the subsequent five years, with only about a 1% rate of either MI or death over that period of time. <clears throat> 
So excellent prognosis associated with normal functional studies. Uh, this is a study that also showed that we can uh, provide uh, incremental prognosis to patients that have, who do, are, are found to have coronary artery disease by the extent of ischemia that we see on their functional imaging studies. In this case, this was uh, patients that underwent SPECT imaging. 10,000 patients were enrolled in the study. And as you can see here, the patients who had more extensive ischemia, as shown in the horizontal axis here, as the extent of myocardial ischemia increased on their scan, their risk dramatically increased. Patients were divided into those who underwent medical therapy alone or revascularization. And you can see here that there's actually appears to be a threshold that when patients um, are treated with medical therapy alone, they have worsening prognosis. And the, setting, and the use of revascularization does seem to have some benefit in those patients that have more extensive ischemia. So we see here that the degree of ischemia can provide even greater prognosis for the patients that have obstructive coronary disease, but it can also be used, this is an example of prognosis directly informing our management strategy, because as we see here, patients that have more extensive ischemia could potentially be targeted for revascularization for the purpose of improved survival. It's important to note that this has actually never been proven in a randomized controlled trial. Those trials are still ongoing, but this is the basis of some of our revascularization decisions. So let's turn our attention back to Cheryl. So let's say Cheryl underwent a stress ECG. She exercised for nine minutes. She developed non-limiting chest pain during exercise, and there were no ST segments that were observed on her testing. So based on this, the lack of ST deviation, we would say that this was a negative study. So what does that mean about her likelihood of having coronary artery disease? Well, she started off with a 50% pretest probability. I plugged it into our nice uh, two by two tables that we learned in medical school using a sensitivity of the test of 68%. And the post-test probability of her, of her having obstructive coronary disease would be 30%. So we see it didn't really move the needle that much in terms of the stress ECG. But we do get very um, accurate prognosis from a low risk score. So although we have some diagnostic uncertainty, we can say with fairly good certainty that she's going to do well over the next few years. How, how would she have done if she got stress imaging? Well, let's say she got a normal stress echo. How does this affect her post-test probability of disease? Based on the higher sensitivity of the test, it would move the needle more, and we can be further reassured with a lower uh, probability at about 15%. So what implications does this have for how we're going to treat Cheryl going forward? So does she have obstructive coronary artery disease? I would say there's still some uncertainty, especially in the setting of the stress CCG. But whether she's having chest pain as a result of coronary disease, we didn't see any ischemia on our testing, so we can say that it would be very unlikely, but if she gives you a good story for it, <clears throat> you could still consider treating with anti-anginal therapy. Does she have severe left main or multivessel disease that would require revascularization? Well, we can say pretty confidently that no, she has a low Duke treadmill score and a negative stress echo would, would rule that out pretty effectively. What is her risk of having subsequent coronary events. Well, we can say that it's very low risk. So in this setting, most people would probably manage her risk factors just according to primary prevention guidelines. So we can find that the functional testing can be helpful for many of these questions that we ask of our tests. So now let's transition from talking about a functional approach to an anatomic approach. So just as a reminder, when we're talking about functional testing, we're really looking for obstructive coronary disease and whether it's able to detect ischemia. And with an anatomic approach, we're able to see the whole picture of coronary artery disease and potentially use that to inform our management. I think it, I told you I was gonna get you back, Scott. Uh, I think it's important to recognize that sometimes we do wanna see the whole picture. This is a very nice picture of Scott Hagen a chief resident, wonderful chief resident, looking very dapper, ready to take on his chief year. 
But you would have lost a lot of information if I didn't show you the whole picture. And I really want to highlight the color coordination between that tie and that tutu. I think it's very tasteful. All right, let's turn our attention to coronary CT and geography. So this is a test that has had dramatic improvements in technology over the past decade. We've been able to have improved spatial recognition that allows uh, better diagnostic performance. And we've also been able to reduce radiation exposure based on improved technique, making this a safer test for our patients. So just like any CT technology, we obtain slices of information about the coronary anatomy. And this can then be used to reconstruct more visually appealing or more helpful pictures of the coronary arteries. Here you see a picture of the left anterior descending artery. And you can see that there is a mid-vessel 50% stenosis of the vessel. But if you don't see it, I recommend that you take a tip from, my, uh, from what I've learned over the course of the year working with the great radiologists, including Dr. Godwin. Always follow the radiologist's green arrow. If you still don't see it, follow the green circle. And if you still don't see it, now you know how I feel. And then you ask Kelly Branch if there's any stenosis there, and he'll say that this is an example of a mixed plaque showing calcium and non-calcified plaque right in the middle of that um, circle, showing us that we're directly able to visualize the presence of atherosclerosis. So let's look at the diagnostic performance of this test. Turns out that coronary CTA performs excellently in terms of its diagnostic ability. This has been shown in multiple studies. This first study that I'm showing here um, shows the sensitivity and specificity of 230 patients who underwent coronary CTA and invasive angiography. So it's looking at the sensitivity and specificity for detecting obstructive disease as defined by invasive angiography. So we can see that it has excellent performance with a 95% sensitivity and 83% specificity. This has been further confirmed by meta-analyses done around that same period of time that have confirmed and even shown that the diagnostic performance could be better at approaching 100% sensitivity for uh, detection of obstructive coronary disease and a high specificity in the high 80% range as well. <clears throat> It's important to note that based on this high sensitivity and the fact that this was used in low to intermediate pretest probability patients, that combines together to say that this has a very high negative predictive value as a test and can be used to very effectively rule out the presence of obstructive coronary artery disease in our patients. So I've already shown you this figure showing the uh, performance of the functional tests. And now comparing the, coronary, the uh, coronary CT angiography performance, we see that it has both improved sensitivity and specificity. So how does it do in ruling out the presence of more severe disease that we'd want to know about in our patients? So this was a study of 1,200 patients that underwent both coronary CT angiography and invasive angiography. And it showed that uh, the sensitivity for ruling out both left main and three-vessel obstructive disease was very high at 95%. Also had a good specificity at 83% and a negative predictive value of 99% that can pretty much allow us to rule out the presence of this severe three-vessel or left main disease. So you're probably getting pretty excited about the, the possibility of coronary CT angiography based on what I've said so far. I would say the major caveat to this technology in terms of its diagnostic ability is this concept that coronary stenosis does not necessarily lead to ischemia. It's actually been shown in multiple studies that the degree of stenosis within the vessel has poor correlation with the development of ischemia. This is probably best shown in the study of patients in invasive angiography where they measured a, a measurement of ischemia on the vertical axis called fractional flow reserve. A, an FFR of less than 0.75 or 0.8% is considered to be ischemia. And they also, they compared the presence of ischemia within that vessel to the degree of coronary stenosis. So generally we define obstructive disease at, a, at above 70%. And here we see that there are patients that had 
very severe obstruction visually, but actually were not shown to have ischemia related to that vessel. Likewise, conversely, uh, in patients that have no obstruction at all visually or less than 50%, which, we, uh, which is, which is a, a measurement of obstructive disease, these patients had ischemia, showing that there's actually poor correlation uh, between stenosis and ischemia. And so that has to be taken into consideration uh, when we're evaluating the performance of, of this test. So let's now turn our attention to prognosis. So the prognosis of this test has probably been best studied in this large CONFIRM registry, which is a multi-center registry, um, including greater than 24,000 patients that underwent coronary CT angiography for the evaluation of stable coronary artery disease. They were then followed for, on average, about three years, and they compared the development of all-cause mortality to the degree of, or the extent of coronary artery disease that was seen on their initial CT angiogram. So as you can see, patients have increasing risk of mortality as the extent of coronary artery disease progresses. So we see that as, so this is comparing the hazard ratio for mortality to people with normal arteries. And we see here that patients with three vessel or left main disease are at five times the risk of mortality over those three years after adjusting for other risk factors for mortality. Importantly though, what I wanna highlight is that we see this throughout the whole spectrum of disease. And as you can see here, there is a significant increase in the risk of mortality in patients that have non-obstructive coronary disease. So we previously kind of didn't care about that, but this is showing that actually the presence of non-obstructive disease has significant impact on the patient's prognosis. And that, uh, based on this study, they showed that non-obstructive coronary disease has about 1.8 times the risk of somebody with normal coronary arteries, thus identifying this as being prognostically important. This concept also goes into showing that a normal CTA, without the presence of any coronary artery disease, can provide us with a lot of reassurance because these patients have a very good prognosis. So this was shown in 1,200 patients that underwent coronary CT angiography. 500 of them had completely normal arteries, and all of these patients were followed uh, up to four to six years. And as you can see in the line up at the top representing patients with completely normal arteries, they actually had zero events, so no cardiac death or no MIs over that five-year period of time. As compared to patients with non-obstructive disease, there was a higher risk of events. And again, those with obstructive disease, as expected, will have more events. But the concept that comes from this is that we can really provide our patients with a warranty period based on the results of a completely normal coronary CTA. And this, when we've compared it to um, the ability for a functional test to provide a warranty, does appear to be a longer warranty period and more robust. So let's take a look at Cheryl's CTA results. So uh, here's an example of her left anterior descending artery, which we see a 40% stenosis of the proximal LAD. She has a 30% stenosis of her left circumflex and 20% stenosis of her RCA. And recall, based on the fact that she has non-obstructive disease, she would have had a negative stress ECG and negative stress echo. So how does this different information that we got from the coronary CTA compare to the information that we got from the stress ECG or ECHO? And how might our management strategies be different? And how does it do at answering our critical questions? So does Cheryl have coronary artery disease? Well, she doesn't have obstructive disease, but now we're identifying that non-obstructive disease is important and she does have that. Is coronary artery disease causing her chest pain? Well, I showed you that the correlation between stenosis and ischemia is not great. So there is some degree of uncertainty, but less likely in the setting of her having um, at most a 40% stenosis. But you could still consider antianginal therapy, again, if she's telling you a consistent story. So does she have three vessel or left main disease, which we'd wanna know about? We can say pretty definitively that no, she does not. 
And what's our risk of subsequent coronary events? Well, we do think that it's probably higher now that we've identified her as having non-obstructive disease. And based on that, she might actually have intensified medical therapy for the purpose of reducing subsequent <laughs> events. So in summary, when we compare the relative effectiveness of a, a functional versus anatomic strategy with coronary CTA, I think some of the major benefits that we get from a functional standpoint is that we're actually able to detect the presence of ischemia, which allows us to inform management decisions based on the extent of ischemia. And we've shown through multiple, multiple studies and multiple decades of research into this that there's very robust prognostic information that can then go on to inform patient management. From a coronary CTA approach, some of the advantages are that it has superior diagnostic accuracy, which allows it to have a high negative predictive value. And we're also able to identify this non-obstructive coronary disease. The disadvantage, though, is this concept of stenosis not being well correlated with ischemia. So wouldn't it be nice if we had a trial that would help us to compare the effectiveness of these two different strategies? Well, we have not only one, but two. So let's take a look at those. OK, so the PROMISE trial. This was a trial of 10,000 patients in the US that were randomized to either a coronary CTA approach or a functional strategy. Within the functional strategy, this was at the discretion of their physician. They could go ECG, undergo ECG, echo, or SPECT, with the majority undergoing stress SPECT. Important to recognize that these were squarely in the middle of our uh, pretest probability spectrum at 50%, and follow-up was 12 months, at least 12 months, but up to three years. So the bottom line of this study was that there was no difference in event rates in patients that were randomized to coronary CTA versus those that were randomized to a functional strategy. And if I zoom into that figure a little bit, you can see that the event rates were really superimposed on each other. And the events that they looked at was a large composite outcome of death, MI, revascularization, hospitalization for unstable angina, all of the things that we would want to prevent in our patients. No difference. The PROMISE trial had no promise for the superiority of coronary CTA. Let's take a look at the Scott Hart trial. So this is a slightly different trial that involved greater than 4,000 patients out of Scotland, hence the name Scott Hart. And they were randomized to either a usual care approach or a usual care plus coronary CTA. The usual care approach involved patients being referred to chest pain clinics in Scotland. They underwent a complete history and physical, and the vast majority of these patients got a, a stress ECG at their baseline visit. Additional testing in either group was then at the discretion of the treating physician, but all patients in the coronary CTA group got, the, got that test. So in terms of their primary outcome, they actually had a, a fairly interesting primary outcome, which was actually just looking at the diagnostic certainty that the physicians had for coronary artery disease. So those that had a coronary CTA had improved certainty of the diagnosis as compared to a usual care approach at about two and a half times the certainty of patients that underwent the usual care approach. It also increased the certainty of the diagnosis of angina related to coronary artery disease at about twice the likelihood of being certain of a diagnosis of this being angina as a result of CAD, which is kind of interesting because we showed the poor correlation between stenosis and ischemia. I think the meat of the interesting findings from this study are really from looking at the secondary outcomes. So this graph is showing the addition or uh, discontinuation of preventative medical therapies according to the testing strategy. So those in uh, green are the patients that were started on either new aspirin, statins, or ACE inhibitors. And the bars in orange showed that those patients were discontinued from those therapies. So you can see that about four times as many patients were started <coughs> on preventative medical therapies as a result of the results from this testing. We can also see that patients were discontinued, um, likely based on a reassuring coronary CTA. And this was more likely than the usual care approach. <coughs> 
So what effect did this testing strategy and medication management have on outcomes? Well, we can see that there was actually a trend toward a reduction in cardiovascular events uh, when we looked at coronary um, cardiovascular death, or MI. And we see that in the coronary CTA group, identified by the blue bar there, there is a trend toward reduction in outcomes. When they did a post hoc analysis, um, they looked at after 50 days, which was the median time point um, to starting these uh, medical therapies. And they did show that there was a um, significant reduction of 50% um, of the events in the coronary CTA group at, uh, as compared to the usual care group. But it's important to note that this is a post hoc analysis of a secondary outcome. So what insights do we get from these randomized controlled trials to be able to compare the testing effectiveness? Well, overall, these trials, when comparing a functional approach versus an anatomic approach, show overall similar outcomes between the two different strategies. There is a trend toward reduction in cardiovascular outcomes when we look at the data from the Scott Hart trial. Um, and this was likely related to the fact that patients that got coronary CTA were more likely to get um, addition of preventative therapies. So in summary, when we try to define what are the relative advantages of these two different testing approaches, a functional approach versus an anatomic approach, I think it can really be divided based on the patient's pretest probability of disease or the expected extent that a patient has um, coronary artery disease. And in the low to intermediate risk group, or pretest probability group, I think this is where we start to see some relative advantages from our coronary CTA. This is based on the very high negative predictive value for our tests, which can help us to rule out obstructive disease. It also allows us to identify non-obstructive disease that can be prognostically important and guide management. And it also allows us to provide reassurance to our patients that have completely normal coronary arteries. In terms of patients that have intermediate to high pretest probability, I still think that the clear advantage is the functional testing approach because this, in patients that we expect to have obstructive coronary disease, this allows us to get more information about the extent of disease, the extent of ischemia, um, and provides a powerful prognosis. Given the correlation with ischemia, this can provide causality for a patient's chest pain. And we have just so many more decades of data that help to guide our information about um, prognosis in these patients and management options. So in conclusion, I think that the coronary CTA, I hope that I've shown you that there is a rationale for its use, especially in patients with low to intermediate pretest probability. I think the question becomes, what are we going to do with this data, with these data? And I really, I now, after reading through this, believe that the relative advantages of the coronary CTA as compared to a functional approach do um, make it a possible, I do think that it should be among the first-line testing options for patients with low to intermediate pretest probability. I don't think that we should go the way of the NICE guidelines by completely abandoning our functional tests. I think rather this should be an additional option that can be used especially for these low to intermediate pretest probability patients. And I don't think we should abandon the whole paradigm of functional testing, but I think there should be a melding of the two strategies together. So thank you very much for your participation, or your, <laughs> your attention and participation earlier. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge um, a few people that have been completely instrumental in putting together this presentation. So I want to thank Dr. Brad Anawalt for all of his help uh, making my figures look really pretty. Uh, Dr. Kelly Branch, thank you for all your help in conceptualizing this talk. And Dr. Steve Finn, thank you for temporizing my excitement about coronary CTA and showing us that functional testing still has great value. I want to thank um, the chief residents for just a huge amount of support over the last year. It's been a lot of fun working with you. And the entire internal medicine residency, you guys are awesome. It's been so much fun working with you over the course of the year. I want to thank my parents and uh, my wife, Amy, for all of the amazing things that she does and all of her support. So thank you very much.
That was great. Um, I really like the way that you laid out the whole idea of what question are you asking and what are we going to do with the information. And I think that, that what that means is we're moving towards, in some ways, a more personalized cardiac testing uh, than we have actually in the past. Uh, for instance, you know, occasionally in the echo lab, a cardiologist, and I say cardiologist because general medicine person would never do this, refers a patient for an exercise stress echo and they come in with a walker and we realize that's, that's not going to work. Um, but let's say that Cheryl actually has dyspnea on exertion instead of chest pain. Maybe Cheryl actually needs a diastolic stress test, which we can do in the echo lab as, as well as an ischemic evaluation. And one thing I just wanted to point out is that we actually are developing um, an imaging consult pager service. Uh, so probably next month you'll be able to call the, the page operator and ask for this service, and then you'll get an imaging expert on the other end of the line that will tell you, sort of walk through the different testing modalities. We have a website we can point you to also. Uh, and then also, perhaps most importantly, tell you how to order it in Epic, uh, which is obviously <laughs> very difficult to do. Um, but I think this, this is a very timely uh, discussion. I think you went through it just in, a, in an expert way, and I think you've really stimulated um, more discussion that we can all have over this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for that talk. I was just wondering with the PROMISE and the Scott Hart trials, did they do any separation between people who were in a low intermediate pretest probability versus high intermediate or all the patients lower risk in those trials? It's a good question. Um, an interesting aspect that I didn't go to, into in my presentation was that although they had in the PROMISE trial, they had like squarely within the intermediate pretest probability of 50%. An interesting finding was that only 10% of them actually had obstructive disease, which really tells us that our, uh, our use of like the diamond forester plots for estimating pretest probability need to be improved upon because those are kind of outdated. Um, so there are new um, testing, uh, uh, like clinical models that can be used to estimate pretest probability. So it's kind of a, I guess I'm not answering your question perfectly, but um, they, they were actually on the lower end, despite the fact that they had this like 50% pretest probability. And I don't think they, that they, at least I'm not aware of them looking at patients differently based on, based on that. Yes. Yeah, so, my turn. That was, a, uh, that was a nice review. So, isn't one of the major lessons of Scott Hart trial that risk factor management is underused? Yeah, I, I think that is a very reasonable reasonable way of interpreting that trial. You know, as I talked about with Dr. Finn a few weeks ago, it could have been irregardless of the test that they got. It just they they got good medical therapy and they did better. Um, I think there is a role for, you know, when you're on the fence about whether somebody should be given intensive medical therapy, we can get some additional information. But I totally agree. This is just further stressing the importance of people that are at risk of bad outcomes should be treated with aggressive medical therapies. Yeah, let me just make a quick comment about Scott Hart. The reason why we can actually learn something from the Scots and from NICE actually is that they actually gave people some not only some information, but what to do with the information. Promise yeah. didn't. They gave you the CTA, and then you were left to your own devices as far as what you're going to do. Scott Hart actually said, here is the CTA, and here is what we suggest you do about it, which was why there was a three-month lag, which is about the time that they went back to their primary care physicians, started their medical therapy, and that's when we saw this play. And so you, so the, we can actually learn something from the Scots, not only that, you know, kilts, you know, and things like that, and really bad food. Um, <laughs> But that if you actually inform and give people information, and this is the whole idea that radiology is coming about with, with uh, you know, this uh, CAD RADS, which is a way of saying, here it is, this is what we suggest you do, same for prostate cancer, same for these other findings. And so I think uh, that actually helps to inform, um, you know, as we move forward, it gives you information, not only to diagnosis, but what you can do to inform and affect progress. All right, well, thank you. I think we need to switch over to the resident teaching award presentations, but uh, thank you for your attention.